Welcome to you all, and uh, Scott McGregor, thank you for joining us. It's not often that you get an applause for your results. I mean, that must be uh, the sort of welcome you like. If only Wall Street would do that, right? Well, Wall Street's a little fickle sometimes. You can have the best results you've ever had, and sometimes your stock goes down. Uh, that happens. So I think we can promise you um, a stimulating discussion this morning. Um, in the technology industry, um, you tend to find hardware guys and software guys, and they are normally, unfortunately, guys. Um, Scott McGregor is both. Um, he's got a background that spans uh, a large area of technology uh, over a long period of time. Um, those of you who can think back to the very beginnings of uh, um, the modern PC industry will probably know about um, Xerox Park, um, Xerox's uh, research center in Palo Alto, where a lot of the great innovations in uh, computing came from. And Scott was there at the beginning, so I'm uh, looking forward to drawing some of that out. Um, before we start, Scott, um, maybe I can um, just, just set what I think is the scene right now, because I think we're at a, a fascinating time technologically where in the technology industry it seems that things come in waves and we can see these waves coming a long way out and we all like to talk about the future that has already arrived and it happened with the dot-com boom because we could see what was possible we talked about as though it was going to happen and then you get a bubble nonetheless the waves are real and what we can see right now is another wave coming and it's the ipad and it's the iphone and it's facebook and it's all these things are building up to some sort of crescendo. And indeed, stock prices are building up to a crescendo as well, <laughs> again, in technology. Um, but it does seem that we're at another tipping point where we can see a, something possible, something's happening around us that's going to change our lives and change society. And I think we all are grappling to understand what it is, how it'll affect us. And it strikes me that a company like yours, you're right in the middle of this. So, so tell us, you know, what do you do and, and how are you making this happen? So let me just start off and explain what Broadcom is for some people who may not be familiar with it. You probably don't realize that actually Southern California has become a major area for a lot of what you use. Uh, Broadcom uh, started 20 years ago and we produce the microelectronic chips that go in a lot of the devices you have. So if you have a popular smartphone or a popular tablet or a computer or a set-top box at home or a digital TV, uh, or you send messages over the internet. It probably goes across the microelectronics products that we make. So my guess is you probably, each of you in this audience, probably own half a dozen or a dozen of our products and aren't aware of that. We don't sell to consumers. We sell to all of the large brand names you're familiar with who make all those devices. Uh, and so we don't advertise, and so we're a little bit under the radar, but Broadcom has grown up from nothing 20 years ago to a Fortune 500 company today uh, that is uh, number one in market share for a lot of the different technologies that go into these devices. So how do we do that? We hire a bunch of smart engineers. Uh, we have about uh, 9,000 employees. 76% uh, of them are engineers, and most of the rest have engineering degrees. And uh, we just try to solve hard technical problems for our customers and embed those in very small devices. Uh, think of it something like the city of Manhattan or the city of Los Angeles. Imagine if you could shrink that down to something the size of a postage stamp or the size of your fingernail. Okay, that level of complexity with billions of transistors, okay, all in a little tiny device uh, that will take us maybe the work of many hundreds of people for many years and we'll sell that for a few dollars. And uh, it's, a, it's a great miracle of so, technology. We make well, hundreds of millions of them. So if, I, so if I rip the back off my iPad, I'd see a little something, a little fingernail there with Broadcom stamped on it, would I? I think if you open pretty much any smartphone or any tablet today, you'll find a Broadcom well, chip. But you are, you are in the iPhone and the iPad and a lot of these things. You can't talk about that. I can we don't, we don't talk about our, our customers. In fact, one of the things our customers say, denying. they love us because we're good at keeping secrets. <laughs> And lest a, a lightning bolt from Cupertino would strike me, I'll, I'll keep it that way. But I could see a smile across your face when I mentioned iPad, so it's obviously helping to... It's a safe statement to right say now. that most yeah. of the tablets out there have our So, <laughs> you talk about hundreds of millions. People in the tech industry now are talking about billions and then tens of billions that everything, everything will have a chip in it. What does that, what does that mean? I think there's been an incredible revolution in technology. It, it used to be that these devices and, and the technology behind them were pretty expensive. And it's been this 
miracle that mm. computer technology has reduced in cost so much. We can make chips now for a dollar, okay, that have far more capacity than anything you could buy in a computer 10 years ago. And the ability to shrink this stuff, not only to be very small, to be relatively inexpensive, and to use very little power, okay, means that you can put electronics in things you just never would have thought of before. And we see this electronics replacing a lot of the copper and mechanical systems that you used to have and enabling new things. People often think, well, but, but why? Why do, I want, you know, why do I want a chip in everything? Why does, why does every, every physical object need a chip? And in fact, will every physical object have a chip? I think you're going to see this happen for a lot of reasons. One, because you can. And part of it will be for the convenience of you. Part of it will be for the convenience of people who want to sell you things. Okay, and so there's two motivations for that, and I think equally important. Yeah. I mean, I want to get onto some of the implications of this later on, because I think it is going to be a very profound change, because not only will they be smart, but they'll all be connected. They will all be linked to the internet, and they'll be sending back information about what they're finding. The most visible thing that we're all noticing right now in terms of this sort of wave of new devices are the, are the smartphones and the tablets. Mm -hmm. Now, you were in at the beginning on some of this stuff, um, back at Xerox in the late 70s, I think, mm -hmm. um, you were working on the graphical user interface, right, which is the screen of icons that we all know on our PCs. I mean, this was before Steve Jobs ever thought about it or Bill Gates ever thought about it or whatever. Um, so, you know, what, what, when you look at human interaction with computers um, going back to then, I mean, what was, what was going through your mind back then and could you see any of this possibility? Absolutely. Those of you who've been around computers a long time or, or have been to computer history museums, computers used to be pretty unfriendly devices that only very geeky people could use and not even very well. You would program them with programming cards, these punch cards. I don't know if anybody old enough here to remember your utility bill used to have a punch card with it. And, you know, back in ancient history. But computers generally weren't something that they expected people to use. And in fact, uh, many companies forecast there'd only be a worldwide market for about 500 of them. And so what happened was that many people started figuring out how do you make them easier to use? And one of the biggest challenges was how do you visually see on the screen things you're familiar with? And so today, you take it for granted that what you see on the screen looks like what you would see when you actually print it. Okay, and that was a pretty major step forward in terms of making computers interesting for the office, which actually had more money than individuals back in those time. And that was sort of the first phase of computers coming into the office and solving office problems. The second phase was computers coming into individuals' lives outside the office, and you would expect to have one at home. And so those were two phases there. But now you were working on this before Steve, so, so Steve Jobs actually visited Xerox, saw what you guys are working on, and went away and did the Mac. Absolutely. Uh, Xerox Park was sort of a, a magical place back in the 70s. It's where things like uh, Ethernet was invented, laser printers were invented there. Um, the, the screen that actually shows you, um, that's divided into tiny bits, bits. Uh, where you could actually see different shaped characters and things. That was invented there. So it was a very interesting place uh, with people who uh, had a lot of different disciplines in, in hardware and software. Uh, there were some people from Xerox Park who were hired away to Apple. They created the first product called the Lisa. The second product was called the Mac. Okay, and you know where that went. Um, I was hired away by a little startup up in Seattle to start a project called Windows. Um, and you probably know where that's ended up. And so, so we have you to thank for that, do we? Wow. Well, yeah, I'm afraid so. Some of that. We're um, gonna have it was to, a, it was a team have, effort. What is your verdict on where Windows has gone in the last few years, particularly Vista, which was not greatly welcomed by many people? Did it, have they gone in the wrong direction with Windows? Windows is, is probably one of the most successful products in the history of mankind. I mean, it, it, it is something that... Uh, Almost everybody on the planet knows what it is. And, and yet it frustrates its users tremendously. Many things do that. But uh, yeah. uh, I think it, it really um, uh, created a standard. And one of the challenges, if you try to support every piece of hardware out there and, and make it useful in every language, it starts to get very big and awkward. And it gets very hard to change without fear of breaking something. And so there's a natural evolution in software that it starts out very innovative and fast moving, and then it slows down over time because it has such a large user base, and the, the danger of breaking it 
gets to be very high, and so you get risk averse and things like that. Mm -hmm. So it, it tends to ossify, and that's what means that new things can come up. And so that's why phones and tablets are making so much success because they don't have any installed base they're worried about breaking. Well, so with the, with the iPhone and the iPad, starting with those and now moving on to other companies' devices as well, we have a new interface which is the touch screen or the multi-touch screen. You can touch it in various places and make it do all kinds of things. Thinking back to you know, the last 40 years and ways of interacting with computers, is this as big a breakthrough as the graphical user interface? Is it a whole new way of dealing with things? I think it's a really important uh, step forward. Um, computers used to just have switches on them and you'd flip the switches up and down, that was sort of boring. And then we invented keyboards and people were familiar with typewriters, so well you could type to the computer. Um, it's sort of sad that we still don't yet have the ability to use our voice very much with computers. That's actually the human's best way to communicate out and that's still underutilized. So I think tablets and touchscreens have really taken us a step further beyond typing things and will make a big improvement, but there's a lot of ways to go because we're still very slow at getting information into computers from people. Right. Apple has pioneered touch screens. Microsoft is working with gestures, using cameras to recognize what you're doing, and we've seen it in the Kinect, which is a game console, but mm -hmm. they're saying now this is how everybody's going to interact with computers. At biz in business, you're going to be using very large screens and waving your hands around in the air. I mean, is is this fanciful or is it going to happen? The Kinect product by Microsoft is indeed a breakthrough. Um, it uses something akin to radar, basically, to see a 3D picture of you and analyzes that to figure out what you're doing. For games, uh, I think it's going to be a, you know, as interesting as the Nintendo Wii, which had the wireless controllers. Uh, so I think that's a great step forward. Whether you're going to stand in front of your computer and wave your arms to try and you know, surf the web, I, I don't think so. Uh, but, but what's important mm. is for the computer to collect, when we're talking right now, okay, you see, you hear what I'm saying, you see my hands moving, you see my lips moving, you can get a lot of information from just uh, all the different things that we're doing here on the stage. Computers are so limited today in terms of how they get information from people. And I think the real breakthrough going forward is to combine touch and sound and all of the ways humans communicate with each other so that computers can get that fidelity of input from, from people. Yeah. There are a number of different technologies and ideas that have been worked on for many years coming together. Next week, we're going to see a demonstration of that when IBM puts up its latest computer, Watson, to play Jeopardy, to play Ken Jennings, the, the all-time Jeopardy champ. And it's a stunt. It's a party trick. But it, and it's very similar to what IBM did 15 years ago when they invented a machine that beat Gary Kasparov at chess. But it takes these sort of stunts every now and then to, to make you pinch yourself and say, you know, that, that machine is pretty smart. I mean, how, how smart are these machines now? And should we think of them as smart? There's a long history of this. Back half a century ago, there was a guy named Alan Turing, and he proposed that the ultimate test of computers, and it's now called the Turing test, which is if you have a human being interact with the computer and they can't tell the difference between whether it's a computer or a human being. Okay, and so many people have tried at this and, and you know, playing chess, well that's something humans were thought to be uniquely capable of doing. Okay, and there are very few humans who can beat a computer chess program anymore. So, well now, is that, does that pass the test? Well, no, because if you have a conversation with a computer, generally, you know, they can't switch and talk about the sports things, they don't have the context. And so, Jeopardy is a very interesting step forward because it has a lot of new context that humans, you know, thought they were uniquely capable of doing. Is a computer smart like a human? No, it's smart different than a human. It's much smarter in some areas and absolutely, utterly imbecilic uh, in others. And so, it'll be very interesting to see, you know, how over time we combine those. Can it, in its brilliance in one area, can it overcome you know, those limitations in other areas. But when you see a demonstration like this where a computer understands natural language, and that traditionally has been considered the hardest problem for a computer to solve, and a definition of artificial intelligence. If a computer can do that, have we reached a turning point? Well, you know, people have been working on that for a while. There's a program written in the uh, 1970s um, that was a simulation of a human paranoid, okay? And 
uh, they would put people up and they would have people who were psychiatrists interview and they said, well, you can't actually meet the person, you have to talk to them by typing stuff in. So they sort of faked that. And they would have this uh, psychiatrist interview the patient over the, the internet. And uh, it did fairly well. Now, a human paranoid, okay, was modeled because they'd be kind of strange sometimes. They wouldn't always get it. They'd have random answers sometimes. And a schizophrenic person, you know, so you can simulate a schizophrenic person, okay? And so now the question is, can you simulate a normal person you'd like to interact with? That's a much harder thing uh, uh -huh. to do. Well, well, let's bring it back to something a little more immediate, which is, um, the living room. So we talked about you know, chips in everything, these millions of devices. We're getting chips in everything in our living rooms too. Um, earlier on, you said part of the reason this is happening is just because we can. Uh, and the living room seems to be a place where that, that rule to me holds good. We've been told for years that what we really want is the web on our TV. And actually, no, people want TV on their TV and they've rejected it so far. What, why now are we gonna see uh, the internet and technology invading the living room, how's it going to happen? Well, I'll go back to those two models I said before. One is, is because it's good for you, and the other is because it's good for people who want to sell you stuff. Okay, it's, it's good for you. It's amazing, in a television chip right now, we can put enough electronics in there that's more powerful than any computer you've been able to buy until the last few years, and just, just add it in there. And so I think you're going to see a revolution of, of TVs that not only do things like 3D and so forth, but they're going to have these beautiful user interfaces. I mean, it's amazing if you put a lot of electronics in there, what you can do. And they're going to look nice. They're going to automatically fix problems in the TV set by downloading new software from time to time. Uh, they're going to let you run applications on your TV, uh, little widgets at the bottom, you know, maybe that update your favorite stock or that uh, tell you what the weather is uh, in your relative's town. Uh, those kind of things are, are fairly easy. One of the challenges is making it easy enough for people to use. And that's been a fundamental challenge of technology all along and was a big issue for computers in making them something that all of you would want to use. If you make it too complex, people won't use it. Studies show that on TVs, if you look at a TV, there are only a couple buttons people ever push on their remote control. There's on off, volume up and down, and channel up. Okay, and you know, people surf, they push that a lot. Uh, but very few of the other buttons are ever used on a TV remote control. And people generally, when they watch TV, they want to be entertained. And that's sort of the lean back mode, as opposed to computers, sort of a lean forward mode. You're engaged, you're, you're doing things. And it's very interesting to see whether the lean forward model of computers is going to apply to the lean back entertain me of TV, where you don't so want to... So it comes back to interface yeah. again. It's all about making it easy to access and use. And Are we there now that Google is on a TV and is trying to develop a simple interface? Is that the answer? We've had a string of failures, uh, actually, trying to do this. There's something mm -hmm. called Web TV, if you remember that. That was supposed to be this little box that you'd put on your TV, and then grandmother could send email you know, from her TV. That was your friends in Seattle uh, again. Yeah, our friends in Seattle did that. Um, the Google TV has not been very successful so far. The initial products out there were, were uh, not big market splashes like they hoped them to be. And part of the issue is that people do not want to see these complex interfaces on their entertainment devices. They want to just have the entertainment devices entertain them better, okay, mm -hmm. but not necessarily do what they would do at the office or in, in their home office uh, on their TV set. The 3D is one of the great demonstrations of of uh, the power of technologies like, like yours and companies like yours where um, the capabilities are now tremendous and yet there's very little content in 3D and most people don't want to put glasses on their paper glasses on their heads when they're watching their sitting in their living room. Um, is that a classic technology that's ahead of its time? Well, let's, let's talk about 3D. If you go back far enough, and there are not very many people in the room who are going to remember this, but when color TVs first came out, the initial color TVs okay, were expensive, and uh, there wasn't a lot of content for them. It was all black and white back in those days. And the first TV shows that were in color had the most garish colors on people. You know, They would wear uh, pure yellow dresses or crimson this or whatever, just so that whoever had a TV set that had color TV would see that that was definitely a color TV and you couldn't confuse it with a black and white TV because of the garish colors. 3D is the same way. 
Okay, the garish 3D stuff. I mean, you, how many times do you want to have rocks thrown at you or spikes coming out of the TV in your face? And I mean, that's ridiculous. I mean, you look around the room. When was the last time you had a spear poked in your face or an explosion with rocks flying at you? That doesn't happen very often, and it's not, it's garish. Okay, the same thing. I think movies like Avatar, they only had a couple of scenes in Avatar with stupid stuff flying at you, but that was much more like looking out a window okay, and seeing a 3D world, very much as if you were looking, you know, you go to a national park and you look at the Grand Canyon, you see this sort of amazing 3D world, and we are still missing content that has realism in 3D as opposed to garish 3D. And I think as that content evolves, it'll be just like, you know, the early color TVs, it took a while. Uh, the content had to be there, uh, the cost had to come down, and it had to be something that was more in common. So I don't think 3D is going to be this sudden surge, but it's going to be slow. Uh, the glasses aren't great, by the way. Uh, people don't like to wear the glasses. There are some technologies that enable you to do 3D without wearing glasses. Uh, Nintendo is about to launch a device, uh, a game device, uh, that's 3D games for kids that doesn't require any glasses. It's a very interesting display. You can buy 3D video cameras right now that um, have screens on them that don't require glasses. The challenge on the larger displays, you can make it work without glasses as long as you're willing to stand in one place. Okay, and Toshiba actually has a very interesting technology. They can make it work without glasses as long as you're willing to stand one of six places. Okay, but you sort of think about sitting next to your, your family on the sofa and watching, you know, and everybody has to sort of move to <laughs> their exact spot to get the 3D right. So I, I think we're not quite there yet on the technology, okay, but, you know, give it 10 years, it'll, it'll get solved. Well it. It'll mm -hmm. get solved. You said part of the reason this is happening is because people want to sell us stuff. So how are they using this, particularly in the living room where we're all vulnerable, we're sitting there leaning back and we'll take anything they push at us. How are they using this technology to sell us stuff better? Ever since the days of Nielsen and the Nielsen ratings and other ways of collecting information on consumers, it became very valuable to people who create the content and broadcast the media to understand the demographics of their audience as specifically as they could so that they could target advertising for them. So for example, if you have a particular show and you know that a certain demographic of people watch it, then you're going to advertise cars, or you're going to advertise dishwashing soap, or you know, whatever, based on that audience. And that information is very valuable. Uh, with set-top boxes, uh, you're probably not aware of it, but your set-top boxes make it very clear to anybody who wants to know exactly what you watch and when. And they don't use that to violate your privacy in sort of the traditional terms you might think about but they do have that information to figure out what ads uh, should be targeted for those shows. And so that information about the consumer's preferences and habits is extremely valuable. And what technology is enabling them to do is to get that information very specific to you. On one hand, that's kind of scary from a privacy point of view. You know, they want you to, do you, do you want people to know exactly what products you buy in the store or what shows you watch? But on the other hand, if you're selling ads, you really don't want to show ads to people who aren't going to buy your product. And so that, I think, is, is a driver for this. And location services, um, what shows you watch, um, uh, other preferences that you have are now possible mm. to collect. Now, historically, as you say, they've been a set-top box has known what we've watched and how long we watch it for. Nielsen's known that for a long time. Um, that information is relatively useless because they don't know which member of the family is there. They don't know whether we're even sitting in front of the TV. Um, and yet now we're suddenly making this big leap where, um, thanks to the internet, thanks to interactive networks where um, they can see us behave and interact in more ways, and also thanks to the ability to bring in all kinds of other data about our interaction from other sources, um, we're suddenly being thrust into a world very rapidly where people know, can actually build a pretty, pretty big picture about us. And when I talk to people in your industry about this, the general response I get is, get over it, that's the future. Everything about you will be known. Is that, is that the future? Will everything about us be known? Is it the complete end of privacy and we should just get over it? I have to quote somebody named Scott McNeely. He ran a company called Sun Microsystems, a very uh, popular computer company. He had a phrase for this. He said, there is no privacy. Get over it. 
and in some extent, to some extent, he's, he's correct, and that there will be a lot known about you. Um, on the other hand, uh, I think there is a reasonable basis for privacy laws and other things that should protect the individual. And this is going to be a brave new world for us as a, a, a species. But, but, but the basic starting point, I mean, whatever the controls and regulations you introduce, the basic starting point is because the technology makes it possible, everything will be known. I mean, that's what we have to accept. So our phones have ears and eyes and sensors and they know where they are. They've got GPS chips. They effectively are monitoring and so everything is known. Is that, is, is that what we have to get over? Let me explain a couple of those things. Your phone does have devices. It has a microphone on it. has a camera on it. Your cellular carrier can turn those on. Okay? And they don't. They generally couldn't be bothered. But if they wanted to, they could turn those on and listen to what we're talking about right now. Um, if you think about some of the face recognition software, there are cameras in airports. There are cameras in neighborhoods. They can recognize faces. Okay? They could track you that way. Um, is an interesting experiment. If you have a smartphone these days, it has a gyroscope and motion sensors and things like that in it. Um, there's a company that was looking at doing remote controls and trying to figure out how do you tell which member of the family is using the remote control. It turns out that there's enough individual difference between how you pick up the remote control and hold it and move it that you can tell the difference between family members. Okay, you know, oh, that's kind of interesting. That's and, very interesting. And th somebody did a, a test on that to show, you know, they wanted to put that in and they were going to use it for a, a certain product. And they did a, a test on that and people thought, ooh, that was too spooky that this device would just know. And, and then they said, oh, well, it uses the camera. It didn't. Oh, it uses the camera. And then they go, oh, oh, that's okay then. Okay, because it was okay that the camera, you know, would recognize your face but the thought that how you pick up a device and hold it would give enough clues about you personally, okay, that but was right, too scary. But the bottom line is right now, we don't know which devices are collecting what. The capabilities are there. We don't know whether they're turned on or not. You don't necessarily know whether they're turned on or not. And uh, uh, I think this is uh, something that can be used for very good purposes. Uh, it can be used for things to make devices really easy to use. I mean, it's great if you're playing a game or you're using a TV remote control that when your kid picks it up, they can't change to the X-rated channels. I mean, that's a, that, that is a good thing, okay? But the fact that, you know, they know which person in the house was watching which TV channel, maybe that's not such a good thing if, if you don't like that. Mm -hmm. So how we learn to deal with this is going to be an interesting challenge for legislation, for technology. Technology is an enabler. It doesn't have a value judgment on what's good and what bad. It makes these things possible. But then we, mm. as the intelligent humans and not computer programs, but at the moment we're relying on at the them. moment we're relying on the good sense of technology companies and service companies, telecom companies and cable companies and so on to use this responsibly. You mentioned, for instance, facial recognition, which is an incredibly powerful technology because potentially. It ends anonymity. It means anywhere you go, you can walk into any store, any public space, uh, people will know who you are. That is very powerful, and Google has decided they don't want to do it yet because they're a very big and responsible company, and they know that if they did it, there would be an outcry. But there are many, many, many other companies that are not as well known and don't feel the same sort of restraints and are quite happy to use it because they understand how powerful it is. So it comes down at the moment to us trusting the big companies around us, does it? I think most people who, who run these companies do have a strong sense of ethics and, and responsibility. So I think that Fancy will certainly... Fancy saying that. I, I, think that will, I think that will certainly put some, some brakes on things. But, you know, people who grow up in small towns, I mean, they, know, they all know each other, okay? They know who goes into what store and, you know, they all talk to each other and stuff like that. What's happening in a sense is that our global community is becoming a little bit more like a small town. So anonymity was a historical accident. It happened between the village and the global village. Right. Someone's explained to me before, and you know that was uh, 150 years. Get over it. It's over. Uh, anonymity is maybe a historical anomaly. A historical anomaly. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> let's assume that mm -hmm. we are going to see some sort of regulation coming, and that we are going to get some sort of control, or somebody's going to get some sort of control over how all this information is being used. At the moment, what we're hearing from the technology industry is they will give us, the users, controls 
well, they'll just give us better technologies. So maybe when we go to Facebook, we'll have all these very complex privacy settings, and I'm sure you've all reset your privacy today and know exactly where you stand, um, and that this will be a solution. Is, is that a solution? It's a partial solution. I, I think, again, you know, people will get used to this over time. If something gets abused, then there will be a, a reaction against it. Uh, there will be knowledge about it. And, and so, you know, there was a big uh, to do when people were intercepting Wi Fi traffic uh, and uh, taking some personal information from that. And there was a big backlash on that, and they fixed it and changed it and, and whatnot. I think we as a, uh, a society are going to experiment with a lot of these new technologies. We're going to use technologies like RFID radio frequency tags and things like that, and they may replace your car keys, uh, your credit cards, and things like that we in should, your we wallet. We should just explain, so RFIDs have very short-range communications so that they identify themselves. When you go near something, that other object knows who you are, what you are. Correct. They're, and they have been implanted in people, right? You could. Uh, well, in fact, been. in yeah. fact, uh, right now, um, a lot of uh, pets have little um, tags inserted into the nape of their neck so that if the pet gets lost and they show up at the pound, they can figure out who it belongs to. Okay, and, and that's a valuable thing because you don't see any problem putting a tag on a pet. If you started proposing to do that for your children, okay, that's very scary, okay, and, and people are less comfortable. Some companies have done it. There's a company in the U.S. that has required its workers I didn't for know security that. reasons to have RFID chips implanted. Yeah. But anyway, I interrupted you. You were saying that though these sorts of things will be self-correcting, that people will feel uncomfortable with them, and there'll be an outcry, and then people will hold back. Companies will hold back. Is that what you're saying? I think this does happen. Here's a great example. I mean, I predict that every person in this room, okay, is carrying their driver's license with them. Okay, if you went back to somebody a couple hundred years ago and said, you're going to be required to carry identification with you that has your picture on it and personal details on it, a couple hundred years ago, they said, no way, that'll never happen. Okay, but every one of you voluntarily car carries ID with them okay, that personally identifies you. And so it's what you're used to. It's what you've become comfortable with. And, and people are comfortable that that doesn't tend to get abused very often. And, and that helps. And so all of us in the technology industry you know, are trying to enable a lot of these things to happen. And then you know, as we, as we talked about, how do we make sure that we don't see excess and if that happens, do we correct it? The big fear here is just a complete lack of transparency and it, it's both that governments and commercial interests will obviously have a very big in, interest in having access to information about us and using that information in ways that we may not feel comfortable with and they don't want us to know about. And so, to take an example, um, the real power in personal data right now is combining different types of data about us. It's what I know, what I post about me on Facebook, plus what I'm doing on my Android phone, plus, plus, plus. And there are people now who are collecting and selling that information in all kinds of ways. And I have no way of knowing what use Facebook is making of my information. They are selling it. They are passing it on to other companies. Um, until there's much greater transparency, it's going to be very, very hard to police that. And yet it's very hard to see how the individual can ever really understand, even with transparency. So how do you solve it? Well, that's a very important factor, which is the aggregation of data about you. So, for example, one company might know simply your zip code. Okay? Another company might know what movies you watch. Another company might know who your friends are. Okay? And the aggregation of all of those things together starts to get scary for people. And you don't have good visibility into that. So I think that's a very important area. You know, how much information and can you aggregate that to collect a total story that might be a little too personal than, than you'd like. Yeah. It seems that location information is, you know, the next big thing here. And, you know, given that we all live in a space-time continuum, you know, space is now suddenly becoming digitized, if you like, and everything about where we are and everything around us is becoming known to computers. And it seems that that's touched off a of sort of boom in data gathering collection, and the whole data market is taking off. Um, are there, you know, what, what do you think about this? Should we be concerned, or is it great for us? Let me first say a little bit about location technology and where it's going, and then let me come back to should you be concerned. Location-based technology is relatively new. Uh, it started off with GPS, okay, and it used to be GPS devices were fairly big and clunky and they took forever to start up and they weren't that accurate and uh, a lot of the data was deliberately fuzzed so you couldn't get good fixes. Today, uh, location technology is improving at a lightning speed 
And not only are there the GPS satellites that the U.S. government has put up there, uh, but there are satellites now. The Russian Federation has put up a similar constellation of satellites, so there's twice that now. Uh, Japan and China have put up their own networks, and the European Union is putting up a network of satellites for location. Um, it enables companies like Broadcom to use the set of satellites from all the different countries to get very accurate fixes because we have a lot more points now to coordinate. It's also gone one step further. One of the problems with GPS, as many of you know, is, for example, in this building we're in right now, GPS would work very poorly because it wouldn't have line of sight on very many satellites. Uh, also, if you're driving down what's called an urban canyon, between tall buildings in, say, uh, New York or Tokyo or something like that, you don't get a very good patch of the sky visible, and so it's hard to get a fix from a lot of satellites. There's some very interesting technologies that allow you to do indoor location uh, within fairly high accuracy, and Broadcom is one of the pioneers of that. We're able to create chips now that give you indoor location within 10 meters. And that's very important because, uh, for example, if you have your cell phone with you when you call 911 because you're having a heart attack, okay, and you happen to be on the 23rd floor of a building, okay, with the older technologies, there's no way the emergency service people will ever find you. You'll be long dead. Okay, with some of the new technologies, you know, there'll be somebody who can figure out what floor of the building it is by the elevation and other things and, and come find you. And, and that, is, that is a miracle. That will save lives and change, you know, the life of people. On the other hand, it's not clear you want Joe's Pizza to know you're walking by their pizza store, okay, and to tell you, hey, we're having a sale today on pizza, come in, special two-for-one lunch special. Okay, some people would find that valuable, some people would find that intrusive. So it's, it's very interesting because the ability to do location, we believe with our technology, we can drive the ability to put location into consumer electronic products for less than a dollar. It's going to go in cameras. It's going to go in every cell phone. It's going to go on all these devices. So that will be possible. And now how will that information be used? Potentially tremendously valuable, but we have to all assume that it means governments will know, if they want to, where we are. They already do. Because of our cell phones. <laughs> they know. The, the phone you have today is already quite useful for that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just one, let's just take this a little bit further out briefly, because I know this sounds like science fiction, but um, you hear more and more people now involved in neuroscience and some of these newer areas talking about reading brain waves. And I heard a scientist uh, only a couple of days ago predicting that um, wearing a band around your head that can read your thought and pass it on to somebody is actually not very far away. I mean, in you know a couple of decades. It, does that sound realistic to you? And is it way out the there? ability to read thoughts has been sort of a holy grail of both technologists and, and uh, 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 I guess, uh, psychic people for, for many years. And, uh, you know, evolution's been trying to solve this problem for about a billion years, and it hasn't solved we it yet. We can do better. We don't, we don't have computers who can provably read the thoughts of another individual, or at least not that stands up to very rigorous scientific uh, uh, experiments. Um, having computers do that or electronics do that, on one hand is scary, again, the thought of, you know, somebody else reading your mind, they're very, there's lots of comedy movies about that and what happens when you're able to do that. Um, but I think it would be very interesting to think a question, okay, and just like you would type a search into Google or you would type it into, you know, one of your favorite computer programs for math or for looking up facts, I think it'd be really great if I could think a question, okay, and but do through you believe, computer assistance get an Do you believe that? Do you believe that will happen? Within our lifetimes? Within our lifetime, I think that's going to be hard. Uh, will it happen eventually? Yeah, almost certainly. Um, the question will be how intrusive will it have to be? Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if, uh, you know, 100 years from now, we all have implants in our heads to do that. But mm. might, and it, we'll be walking down the street with tinfoil hats to prevent people <laughs> tin scanning Tinfoil hats brains. and tinfoil wallets and things all like right, that. All right, we're going to open this up for questions in a minute, but I just wanted to talk... Um, uh, briefly about um, President Obama's State of the Union mm -hmm. recently, which um, threw down a challenge to um, American innovation and ingenuity. And he talked about a Sputnik moment, said the country was facing a, um, a real turning point. And um, uh, he, he seemed to raise the question of whether U.S. technology leadership that we've all taken for granted for so long is in jeopardy. Uh, is it at risk? I think 
the United States, on one hand, is still creating many of the most uh, talented, uh, educated people on the planet. We have arguably the best universities in the world. There are other countries that have great universities too. The U.S. has a lot of them. And uh, that's great on one hand. On the other hand, we have a crisis, I believe, in our educational system right now in that uh, for us to compete as a country, uh, we do not have enough people going into science and math and engineering uh, in order to push that forward. Uh, there are many other countries that have taken that as an initiative. Uh, they're getting much higher scores. They're graduating more engineers. And they're encouraging people to make that a career. And so, uh, you know, there's a longer topic we can go into, but Broadcom, for example, believes this is such a crisis that we've created the Broadcom Foundation, and one of the things we've done in the Broadcom Foundation is we are now sponsoring middle school science fairs across the country, uh, providing prize money and, and various other kinds of things, I think, to drive this. But um, it's going to be a multifaceted effort of how do we fix this and how do we make it fun. And the reason we chose middle schools is because middle school is when the average person makes a decision about whether they're going to go forward with science or math. And especially for minorities or for women or other people who may have had less experience in this, if they don't decide in eighth grade or so that they want to go into this area, it's not going to happen because they're not going to take the right courses, they're going to be behind and they won't catch up. So, you know, these are kinds of things I think that we as a country and many other countries of the world, I think, you know, the UK, Europe has the same challenges. Uh, but we as a country, I think, need to really take this seriously or we will lose our lead. You obviously made a decision after studying psychology to go into computer science. Um, if you were back at that point in your life again, would you make the same decision? Because it just seems a lot of people in, that, in the position you were in are just not making the decision anymore. Have, does the world just look different to people in that, in that position? When I was a kid, science was much more accessible. You could play with devices, you could do things. Um, in the you interest, could make things. You, you could, could make things, things, you could make explosives, you could do, all, you know. And, and you know, when you're an eighth grade, when you're an eighth grade kid, that's pretty exciting, right? And you could make things that make smoke or bad smells or, or you, could, you could shock yourself with something. And I think one of the things that we've done is we've made stuff so safe. I mean, have you guys looked at a chemistry set these days? It is the most boring thing in the world. If you're, the most exciting thing in a chemistry set these days is you can put two drops of stuff you could drink together and it will make bubbles, okay, or turn slightly green, okay? And we don't have things that excite people about technology in the world and a lot of that hands-on learning that I think happen. And so we need to figure out how to get more of that. So we turn it into theory it's, and it's boring. It's, it's boring, but and I think we need to make it exciting, and that's one of the things, for example, science fairs do. They encourage kids to get hands-on experience and do real technology. Yeah. Talking of making things, your company doesn't make things. You have a lot of brain power, but like a, a lot of U.S. tech companies now, you design things, and then somebody else somewhere else, normally China or Taiwan, makes it. Um, I'm hearing more and more people say the U.S. has to get back to making things now in technology to really keep its lead. Is that true? Well, making things, you can make things that are of intellectual property and you can make things that are physical devices. Uh, Broadcom creates the technology behind these chips and the designs and creates the very detailed blueprints, if you will, that we turn over to other places to manufacture because, frankly, the labor cost is a lot lower and we would die if we tried to make that in the United States with the labor cost in the United States reality in the electronics business is that almost all of the manufacturing has moved overseas. Now, does it make sense to do that in the United States? Well, you need to solve the difference in labor cost. You know, yes, it'd be great to make it in the United States, but until you solve the difference, factor of 10 difference in labor cost, you would have to subsidize it so much. Now, the thing I think the United States needs to pay attention to is don't lose the creation of that intellectual property. Okay, you may have lost some of the hourly wage manufacturing skills, and, and until the, the labor corrects, that's a problem. But don't lose the intellectual property piece of it, the, the creation of, of intellect, uh, the engineering and stuff. If you lose that, that will be very hard to get back. You can get the manufacturing back if you address the labor uh, issues. You can't get the intellectual property back if you but lose e that. But even if the U.S. technology industry, industry succeeds, it's not going to create a lot of jobs in the U.S. then? 
Still well, I think it will create a lot of jobs. I mean, Broadcom hired 1,800 people last year. I mean, there. How many of those are in the U.S.? Most. Hmm. Most of our most of our employees are in the United States. Uh, we have relatively high-paid jobs. Uh, the average uh, wage of a U.S. employee at Broadcom is is a couple hundred thousand dollars. And so these I are good jobs. I think you'll get jobs. a few resumes at these the are, end of this. These are, no. these are, these are, good, these right. are good jobs, and they pay a lot of taxes. Good. And, well, uh, let's, let's open this one up for questions. Our namesake, um, Peter Drucker, in 1954, in his book, The Practice of Management, um, said that any enterprise that attempts to centralize responsibility at the top is, is destined not to succeed. So just a quick question about your management style and leadership at Broadcom. At Broadcom, uh, I believe very much in decentralizing decisions and decentralizing management. And one of the biggest mistakes a lot of the tech companies can make is when you have a very strong founder or a uh, single individual who tries to centralize too much decision making. And what's important and what's worked very well for us is that Broadcom has a number of businesses. We have 20 some odd businesses at Broadcom, each one headed by a general manager who makes decisions on pricing, product roadmap, which customers they work with, and they own that. Okay, and every morning they get up and they worry about how is that business doing, and we measure them on lots of financial metrics and how much do they spend and what resources do we get. Uh, but they have the ownership of that, and so that decentralizes a lot of those decisions, and I think that's allowed Broadcom to scale where many companies uh, uh, fail uh, by enabling those people to do that and pushing that decision-making down. You talked about your interest in education, and there is a field that seems to me touching both of your areas of background called persuasive technologies, which is the use of human technology interactions to influence or persuade, presumably in an empowering way. What do you see as the future of persuasive technologies and the use of these chips and human technology interactions to persuade and its potential role in education? I think technology is um, a tool, and where it's going is it's going to enable us to have more power in the hands of more people at low cost. So the technology that a student will be able to carry with them is going to go up by orders of magnitude over the next decade. And that technology, I believe, can be used for incredibly valuable things. There's no reason to have physical textbooks anymore. Uh, I watch my kids go to school and I can't lift their backpack that they're carrying with all those books in it. There's no reason not to have all that uh, on a tablet or something that they take with them. Uh, there's no reason why the student shouldn't have access to curriculum materials uh, from lots of different places. So by persuasive technology, I'm going to invert that a little bit to learning technology, you know, the ability to help me learn. Uh, I think we can get that from lots of different sources. Uh, there's no reason why somebody on any place on this planet shouldn't be able to get access to curriculum materials that will help them learn anything they want. And I think that's going to be a, a, quite a revolution. And there's a lot of initiatives. The One Laptop Per Child initiative is trying to do that and other things. But as this technology drops the price of in incredible power that you can put in a student's hands, and the internet connects all of that, making it possible to get access to it, I believe that is the, the Petri dish, if you will, that will enable you know, just learning like we haven't seen it before to everyone on the planet. The techniques of persuasion and propaganda grow exponentially as well. Absolutely. I think one of the most important learning skills in that world where you have access to information is critical thinking. Okay, and this is something I think our education system doesn't do as good a job on is critical thinking. Teaching people how to learn basic logic, you know, what's right, why is that person telling me this, what's in it for them, and you know, some of that you would call street smart, some is sort of basic logic syllogisms. Uh, but I think all of us need to understand you're going to get information from a lot of different sources. How do you decide what's right and what's wrong? That's a moral compass, but it's also an intellectual capability to sort the I wheat heard, from the chaff. I heard someone yesterday talking about intellectual spam. Um, you know, that actually <laughs> now we phrase. used to all this spam, but all this stuff <clears throat> is processed and given to us now. A lot of it's intellectual spam. Let's, uh, mm -hmm. My father joined IBM in 1961 and worked there for 35 years. And, and uh, he strongly remembers uh, sitting in a, in a meeting and 
the executives at, at IBM saying, you know, hardware's where it's at, this, the software stuff, we've got this little guy in Seattle that we're gonna get to help us with that. And they kind of missed the boat. And, and IBM struggled for years, and then the so software industry exploded. You're providing products and technologies and technologies today that make them work better, faster, quicker, more effectively and efficiently. But how do you look to the future to position your company appropriately for that next wave, you know, of that next new technology that's 10 years out? How do you do that? I think that's a very fundamental question, and everybody who runs a business better spend some time thinking about that because the more successful you are, okay, the more you can get stuck into a particular model. And IBM that you mentioned is a great example. Now, IBM is also a great example of a company reinventing itself. Okay, IBM uh, originally was a data tabulator company, and they sort of transitioned to computers very well. And then when the box revenue started to have lower margins, they transitioned to more of a software and a services company, which they're very successful in today. So that's a great example of transformation over a period of time. Uh, in, in our industry, uh, currently we're benefiting from uh, a phrase I like is we're all sort of running up the down escalator. Okay, all of this technology is sliding into the little microelectronics. So a lot of what makes all of these cool devices work is moving away from some of the boxes themselves into the microelectronics and into the software on them, as well as on the other side into the services uh, that are provided. So information as a service and other kinds of services you buy. Uh, so today we're at a good phase in that. Over time, the value may shift more towards services, more towards software, and so we as a company constantly have discussions on that, and you know, we better call that right. Uh, and it's, it's a classic case of a company that gets a little too comfortable and a little too big with something that works, and then they miss the phenomena that, that wipes them out. And you know, the classic case is mini computers, okay? You go back, IBM was gonna really do well in mini computers, and there were a number of other companies that you probably don't remember anymore, because they focused on mini computers and the PC wiped them out. Okay, the interesting question right now is, well, is the PC gonna get wiped out by tablets and smartphones? Maybe. And so these are the transitions that anybody running a company, whatever's specific to your industry, better pay attention to. I have far less fear of commercial companies gathering data about me so that they can make my life easier. And perhaps that fear needs just to be addressed by education that'll give consumer power. What I have far more fear about is my government uh, getting a lot of information about me. And since you work globally and uh, not all governments are democratic, is that a conversation that you that the company engages in um, the government, the information that government can collect on citizens around the world and, and what they're likely to do with it? And do you have policies and or anything in place? And I guess that goes into the ethics area. We uh, try to do right as a company, and to my knowledge, we aren't doing anything that would probably concern you in that regard. Uh, we, we try very hard to do that. Now, our technology is a tool, though, and it's possible for somebody else to misuse a tool that we might be unaware of, and that's always a challenge. The point you made, though, about education is, is really important, and let me, let me pick an example here. Uh, there's probably, over the next couple decades, we will probably see RF tags go in most product merchandise. Okay, and the advantage of that is that you have things like smart shelves. The shelves know whether there's stock on the shelves or not and other things. Uh, there's a, a clothing company that, known for making sweaters and some other things, um, announced that they were going to do that and it was going to really automate a lot of the stores and they had an outcry from people that people were, were you know, totally terrified about their sweater having one of these tags in it because of all the personal things it was going to tell. And this is an education issue because the only thing that tag tells is, hi, I'm a red sweater number 423, <laughs> okay? And, and there is, you know, that's probably not something that you would worry about if somebody could learn that you're wearing a red sweater that came from this clothing company. Um, there's a lot of things you can do. I think it would be great for clothes to have encoded in them washing instructions. I think it's great that you throw all your clothes into the washing machine and push wash. Okay, and it says, please remove the red sock. Okay, uh, uh, you know, the, the, these, are th these are things that I think are comfortable and safe, 
but people worry so much about the other stuff that they, they often... Yeah. You know. Let's move on, but just to encapsulate that question again, I mean, what I hear from companies in the technology industry is, you know, we make stuff that goes in boxes. Our stuff goes in the guts of these boxes. We don't know who those boxes are sold to, which governments buy them, how they use them, but that's not our problem. Is that right? It, it, it's, it's not our ability to control, but it's all of our mutual problem. And if there's an abuse of privacy, if there's an abuse of that information, government I think power, we, all have, government we all have a duty to make sure it gets stopped. All right, there's a question over here. Another privacy question. Um, how do you, as the CEO of a Fortune 500 company, communicate with your attorneys, and how do you do it privately? I'm not sure I understand the question. I well, sit in a room email, and I meet with them. Are you able to email and have cell phone conversations and ensure that those are private conversations? I think there's a couple issues there. One is, is there is an at attorney-client privilege, and so people who breach that, you know, there are certain legal ramifications of that. Um, I, I always heard a phrase is, don't do anything you'd feel bad about being on the front page of the New York Times or the Financial Times. And so I try to live that rule also and not do things that, you know, would be horrible if discovered. So <laughs> that's I think our ambition to put you on the hand. front page. <laughs> in the past 20, 25 years or so, we've seen technologies in terms of uh, space and, and memory and, and processing go up exponentially. Mm -hmm. And it's safe to assume that in the next 10 years, we'll probably see uh, something like exabyte hard drives and ridiculous amounts of... Uh, of um, memories and, and chips. Now, the question I have for you is, how do you evolve your technology in such a way that it, it helps facilitate this move? Or not necessarily facilitate, but helps uh, have these machines run and yet still keep up with Wall Street's unrealistic expectations? <laughs> well, I, I think one of the th one of the reasons we hire a lot of smart engineers is to do exactly that and to you know cleverly do it. In, in our industry, there's something called Moore's Law. A uh, guy from Intel, Gordon Moore, who said that every 18 months the technology capabilities will double. Okay, and that's been true now for an incredibly long period of time. Uh, I, I think we you know enjoy that. That's great. It makes things more challenging and and whatnot. And and the capacity of memory, the capacity of other things will increase, but also the the model will change. So I don't think your capacity on your handheld device will go up infinitely. I think you're going to start using the network. Why do you need to keep copies of all this stuff? Just use the network. You'll be connected. The concern, if anything, you hear these days is actually that Moore's law is coming to an end. That this wonderful sort of cycle that's just given us all this great stuff might run out at some point and actually we're not going to see technology advance so fast. Is that a concern that you have in the chip business? The demise of Moore's law has been predicted for decades. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so it may eventually happen, but I'm not so sure. All right. I'm interested to hear your thoughts um, about Egypt. Recently, President Mubarak had to uh, shut down the internet and um, President Obama made a statement claiming that he was uh, in support of that. And so they put the internet back on. And I also read a report that they've actually developed a, a way to sort of do that in the United States if the internet posed a threat to government stability. So um, I was just interested to hear your thoughts on, on should we sh uh, shut down the internet if it does throw a pet to uh, government stability? And, and what sort of problems will we foresee in the future if you do? I'm, I'm not a politician, so I'm going to duck the political angle of your question, but let me respond on the technical side. The internet was developed by the U.S. Department of Defense to survive the United States being attacked in a nuclear war and to survive that. And that means that the internet would survive random points and communication points being destroyed and still be robust and connect everything that didn't get destroyed. And what that means is that it's extremely difficult for anybody to shut down the internet. And that's frustrating to governments, okay, but it's also, you know, a very positive thing for people who want to communicate. And so the ability to shut down the internet probably is not something that could be done easily by any government for any protracted period of time. But just to, but to, to follow that, the U.S. government does want to have the power to do that. It is in a bill at the moment, and they would have the power to turn it off for most people if they wanted to. 
I think that has some technical challenges. Yeah. In, in responding to your question, um, the dilemma in American education, uh, and I, uh, I think you will have to address this politically, because a, a very telling comment was made by the president of the American Institute of Architects. In visiting China, uh, the many American architects, frontline architects, are working only in China. China is modernizing faster than anyone on earth. The president of China commented, said you in America are led by primarily lawyers. Our leaders are engineers. It's an interesting point. I've also heard that we could solve the balance of trade problem by exporting our lawyers, but... Uh, <laughs> Uh, you, you know, I, I think you need to have, you need to have both, and uh, I, I don't think it's a problem. We, we have the rule of law in the United States, which I think is something we're very proud of, and a lot of other countries do not have the rule of law. Um, some countries have, you know, the rules are a loose-leaf notebook, and I, I think that's something we've done very well at. Now, I believe the emphasis has moved a little too far away from engineering, People would rather be sports stars and would rather be movie stars. And of course, here in LA, we like our movie star industry. Okay, but it needs, and I think Obama said this uh, in his speech the other day, it needs to be just as cool to win the eighth grade science fair as to uh, you know, be an athlete or, or, or watch a sports event. And I think that's very important for us to recapture. The last question we'll take over here then. We've heard a lot about how um, your technology helps with communication and education, but where is it going in terms of health? I mean, is there anything that, that is coming new that will make us healthier that might involve your technology? That's a great question, and um, I'm very excited about where that is going. If you take the basic ability to put intense computer power and lots of communication inexpensively into people's hands, it's a simple step, well, a, a straightforward step forward. Uh, on top of that, to add sensors for health capabilities. For example, there's no reason you couldn't build into your smartphone the ability to uh, sense your pulse, uh, your blood pressure, other kinds of things there, and maybe automatically call 911 if you're having a health problem uh, or let you know. Uh, I believe uh, taking technology and applying it to individual health is going to be a dramatic revolution over the next few years. It's something our company is very interested in. You know, how do you combine communications and computing power and awareness of health. Uh, there's some technologies now that will do non-invasive sensing of blood chemistry. One of the terrible things for diabetics is that they have to stick themselves lots of times a day and because they have to get a sugar reading. Being able to do that with a, um, a laser scan in of without penetrating things and have your cell phone do that and tell you your sugar's high or low. Uh, to look at other abnormalities in blood chemistry and other body fluid chemistries, I think is going to really revolutionize a lot of making healthcare more immediately available to people and doing a lot more on the preventative and diagnostic side.